Beneath the canopy of night, Hazel Grace Lancaster reclines in the meadow, her gaze drawn to the celestial tapestry above. Hazel's life is an interminable battle against stage I thyroid cancer, an omnipresent companion that necessitates her reliance on an oxygen tank tethered to her by a nasal cannula. Her parents, Franny and Michael, and her physician, Dr. Maria, steer her toward a church support group for cancer sufferers known as the literal heart of Jesus. The group's facilitator, Patrick, a survivor of testicular cancer and divorce, resides with his parents but clings to life with an yielding optimism. Franny's desire for Hazel to forge connections in the group is unrelenting, yet Hazel sees it as a cruel twist of fate for a child to succumb to cancer. Amid one of Hazel's visits to the support group, she crosses paths with Augustus Waters. During the meeting, Gus's unwavering gaze remains fixed upon her. Patrick first calls upon Isaac, who lost an eye to a tumor and now sports a glass replacement, expressing gratitude for his smoking hot girlfriend, Monica. When Gus is summoned, he recounts his remission from osteosarcoma after the amputation of his right leg, replaced by a prosthetic limb. Patrick inquires about Gus's fears, to which he candidly admits his dread of oblivion. Hazel counters with a bleak reminder that everything and everyone will ultimately fade into obscurity, and if that terrifies him, he should simply disregard it. After the meeting, Hazel lingers, waiting for her mother, and Gus approaches her. They bear witness to the tender embrace and repeated vow of always exchanged between Isaac and Monica. Gus elucidates that this ritual signifies their eternal love for one another. He learns Hazel's name and calls her beautiful. To Hazel's dismay, he casually places a cigarette in his mouth, tarnishing her initial impression of him. Gus clarifies that he never actually lights the cigarettes he clutches, a measure taken to deny the deadly item any power. He extends an invitation to Hazel to visit his home and watch a movie. As Gus navigates the road with a touch of recklessness, he inquires about Hazel's life outside her cancer narrative. In response, she reveals her mundane existence, but he vehemently disagrees. He gifts her his cherished book derived from a beloved video game, Counterinsurgents, and Hazel reciprocates by recommending her favorite novel, An Imperial Affliction. She discloses that the book is not your typical cancer story. Hazel awaits Gus's call, and after a few days, he reaches out, having completed An Imperial Affliction. He expresses astonishment at the book's unconventional conclusion, where the protagonist, Anna, seemingly perishes mid-sentence. Hazel excuses herself from dinner to converse with Gus on the phone, but their exchange is interrupted by Isaac's mournful serenade in the background. Gus invites Hazel over to discover that Monica has parted ways with Isaac, who is now grappling with a psychotic episode. In an act of therapeutic catharsis, Gus allows Isaac to vent his frustration on his basketball trophies. Amid the wreckage, Gus and Hazel discuss the enigmatic ending of the book, and she discloses that she has penned countless letters to the author, Peter Van Houten seeking answers to questions that linger beyond the narrative's conclusion, like the fate of Anna's mother and her relationship with the Dutch tulip man, as well as the ultimate destiny of Anna's pet hamster, Sisyphus. During a hushed evening phone call, Gus unveils to Hazel an astonishing discovery. He has managed to reach out to Peter Van Houten's assistant and received a reply to a message he sent. Van Houten expressed gratitude for their interest in an imperial affliction, but firmly conveyed that he had no intentions of crafting any sequels to the story. Hazel, taken aback by the simplicity of this response, decides it's her turn to seek answers from the enigmatic author. In the following days, Hazel crafts her own email to Van Houten, riddled with the questions that have lingered in her mind. A reply from Van Houten soon graces her inbox, once again thanking her for her intrigue in the narrative and extending a surprising invitation for her to visit him in Amsterdam. Ecstatic about this prospect, Hazel shares the news with her mother, who longs to make her daughter happy but realizes that such a journey is beyond their means. Hazel later shares the contents of the email with Gus, and their conversation stretches deep into the night, clocking in at 1.0 am. Finally, it's time to hang up, and in unison, they affirm, okay? This simple word evolves into their own shared always. The revelation of Van Houten's invitation is shared with Gus, who suggests involving the Genies, an organization akin to Make-A-Wish, to fulfill Hazel's dream. Hazel discloses that she has already used her one wish to visit Disney World, leaving Gus disappointed at the cliché choice.
A short while later, Gus appears at Hazel's doorstep, bearing flowers and an invitation to a picnic at a park boasting a colossal skeleton-themed playground called Funky Bones. Gus jests about his history with romantic conquests at this spot, humorously attributing his status as a virgin. As they enjoy their picnic, Gus reveals that he has successfully negotiated with the genies to grant Hazel's wish of visiting Amsterdam, filling her with elation. However, an unexpected complication arises when Hazel awakens in the middle of the night, gasping for breath as fluid floods her lungs. Her parents whisk her to the hospital, with Gus left waiting outside due to the strict family-only policy. Hazel undergoes the draining of fluids from her lungs and eventually recuperates. During a consultation with the medical team, it becomes apparent that her physical condition prohibits any kind of travel. Hazel is flooded with memories of her time in the ICU as a child, when her mother, Franny, tearfully urged her to let go, fearing she would no longer be a mother. Despondent, Hazel sits by a swing set in her childhood backyard, a creation her father built. She dials Gus and shares her sorrow. He rushes over, and they sit on the swings together. Hazel compares herself to a live grenade, dreading the destruction she may cause to everyone in her path. And in a selfless act, Hazel decides that they should remain friends, sparing Gus from potential heartache. Days later, an email from Van Houten's assistant, Leidweech, brings a glimmer of hope. After learning about their travel plans to Amsterdam, she renews the invitation. Hazel immediately calls her mother, who had been secretly planning the trip, and joyfully confirms their upcoming journey. She embraces Franny and texts Gus, who responds with the optimistic message, everything is coming up waters. With determination, she gazes at her lungs and urges them to cooperate. The eagerly anticipated day arrives, with Gus pulling up to Hazel's home in a limousine, determined to embark on this adventure in style. Though initially nervous, Gus finds excitement as their plane takes off. Their first day in Amsterdam is filled with a picturesque canal ride and a visit to the Dutch restaurant, Orangi. Hazel dons a charming blue dress gifted by her mother, leaving Gus captivated by her beauty. As they dine, Dom Peregnine is served, and they savor it. Gus takes the opportunity to declare his love for Hazel, a declaration that evokes a radiant smile. The waiter surprises them by announcing that their entire dinner has been paid for by Van Houten. The following day, Hazel and Gus make their way to meet the enigmatic author. Leidwiji welcomes them into the chaotic environment of Van Houten's home, replete with unopened fan mail scattered across the floor. In the presence of the author, clad in pajamas and indulging in scotch, Hazel and Gus anticipate answers to their burning questions. However, their anticipation is met with Van Houten playing Swedish rap and responding to their inquiries with philosophical gibberish. Frustration mounts, and Gus finally questions whether Van Houten is playing with them. In response, Van Houten delivers a rude remark about Gus's illness. The situation further deteriorates as Van Houten refuses to address Hazel's queries and insults their afflictions. In a moment of defiance, Hazel tells the author to go screw himself, and they storm out, their quest for answers ending in bitter disappointment. Horrified by Van Houten's disgraceful behavior, Leidwig Jag Keisel and Gus to the Anne Frank house. This historical site, unfortunately, lacks elevators, forcing Hazel to ascend the daunting staircase and ladder, placing a considerable strain on her breathing. They reach a floor where Anne Frank's diary is narrated aloud, emphasizing the pursuit of beauty. It is at this moment that Hazel and Gus share their first kiss, and the assembled onlookers, including Leidwig G., applaud this tender exchange of affection. Returning to Gus's room, they make love for the first time, cementing their deep bond. Before parting, Hazel leaves Gus with a drawing symbolizing the large circle of humanity and the smaller circle of 18-year-old boys with one leg outside. On their final day in Amsterdam, Hazel and Gus share breakfast with Hazel's mother, Franny, before embarking on a solitary stroll. Seated on a bench, Gus reveals a painful truth about his health, recounting a time when he felt an inexplicable pain in his hip and underwent a PET scan. Hazel already anticipates the grim revelation. Gus discloses that the scan lit up like a Christmas tree, signifying the return and spread of cancer throughout his body. Overwhelmed with sorrow, Hazel rests her head on his shoulder and tears flow. In an effort to lighten the somber mood, Gus playfully suggests they engage in a passionate kiss. Upon their return to Indianapolis, Hazel, Gus, and Franny are greeted by Michael, who picks them up. A few days later, Hazel and Gus offer support to Isaac, now blind as he reveals that Monica hasn't spoken to him since their breakup. 
In an attempt to lift his spirits, Hazel and Gus purchase eggs and embark on a mischievous adventure, pelting Monica's car with the eggs. In the middle of the night, Gus summons Hazel to a gas station, where she finds him in a dire state, covered in mucus and vomit, afflicted by an abdominal infection related to his G-tube. Although Gus pleads with Hazel not to call an ambulance, she does so, and he is transported for medical care. Gus's battle against cancer continues with more treatments, until the doctors ultimately decide to discontinue chemotherapy. His deteriorating condition now necessitates a wheelchair for mobility. During a picnic at Funky Bones, Gus confides his desire to leave a lasting mark on the world and live an extraordinary life before his impending death. Hazel, however, takes offense to this aspiration and reminds him that the love of his family and herself should suffice. In the end, they share a moment of reconciliation over a glass of champagne. On another evening, Gus calls Hazel to invite her to the literal heart of Jesus for a gathering, along with a special request to prepare a eulogy for him. As Hazel begins to leave, her parents intervene, setting up dinner, an argument ensues, but the fundamental truth emerges. Her parents' love will endure, and her mother is training to become a speaker, ensuring they find fulfillment even after her departure. At the church event, Hazel, Gus, and Isaac partake in what can be considered a pre-funeral for Gus, as he desires to attend his own funeral. Isaac initiates a eulogy, adding a touch of humor yet sincerely expressing his reluctance to see a world without Gus. Hazel shares their love story and delves into the concept of infinite numbers between one and zero, countless infinities, and her profound gratitude for their shared infinity. In their final exchange, they convey I love you one last time. Gus passes away eight days later, and the call notifying the Lancaster family arrives in the middle of the night. As her parents enter her room, Hazel intuitively understands the news and begins to weep. She recalls a time in treatment when she rated her pain as a 9 on a scale of 1 to 10. The nurse commended her for considering a 10 as a 9, and Hazel now recognizes that she reserved her 10 for this very moment. Gus's funeral is a somber affair, attended by Hazel and her parents. To her surprise, Van Houten is in attendance. Hazel is called upon to speak and delivers a fresh eulogy. After the service, she decides to drive home alone when Van Houten unexpectedly enters her car. In their conversation, she discovers that Gus and Van Houten maintained contact before Gus's passing, with Gus urging Van Houten to visit Hazel and answer her questions. Van Houten reveals that the character of Anna was inspired by his own daughter, who succumbed to leukemia at the age of eight. But before their parting, he hands Hazel a letter, which she crumples and discards. As she drives away, she observes Van Houten taking a swig from his flask. Hazel's father offers comfort following Gus's loss. Later, Isaac visits her and reveals Gus's deep love for her, even to the point of obsession. He inquires about Hazel's reading of the letter from Van Houten, only to learn that it was composed by Gus. But the letter unfolds as a eulogy for Hazel, narrated by Gus's voice. He recalls the moments he watched over Hazel in the ICU while she slept and ponders their potential future together. He speaks of his admiration for her beauty, personality, and the power to choose who causes one pain. Gus asserts that he cherished his choice and hoped Hazel did too, concluding with the question, okay, Hazel Grace, 